Technically, chemistry is the study of matter, but I prefer to see it as the study of change. It's growth, then decay, then transformation. It's fascinating, really. Chemistry is at the center of the movie Fight Club. The chemistry of a man and society, the chemistry between a man and woman, but most importantly, the chemistry of chemicals. But how accurate is the chemistry of Fight Club? Can you make napalm from orange juice? Will natural gas blow up an apartment? Can you use soap as an explosive? Today, we will answer those questions, most likely with a lot of fire and a lot of booms. All actions are performed by a trained chemist in a controlled environment. Do not try this at home or anywhere else. This is an educational video. Now with that being said, science time. The first chemistry that comes up besides the pseudo-bromance is during the first meeting of the narrator and Tyler Durden. Tyler says, Did you know if you mixed equal parts of gasoline and frozen orange juice concentrate, you can make napalm? No, I did not know that. Is that true? That's right. He's so sure of it. Let's see if it's true. Napalm is a term for thickened gasoline, used for sticking to things and lighting them on fire. So gasoline being in the mix is a good sign. According to the clip, I start by mixing equal parts gasoline and orange juice concentrate. I used a stir rod and slowly the gasoline and concentrate began to mix. This makes one dangerous mimosa. Once completely mixed, I took a sample to do a burn test. It burns okay, so let's try a little bit more. To be completely honest, I didn't expect this to work as well as it does. As soon as it gets hot, the gasoline boils out and keeps the flame going but it doesn't stick very well, a key part of napalm. So, how is napalm made? Well, the name gives it away. It's a combination of naphthenic acid and palmic acid. Both of these are just long chains of carbon with a carboxylic acid group attached to them. We can find long carbon chains with carboxylic acids in the cooking aisle at Walmart. Coconut oil is a mix of a bunch of these carbon chains. One such chain is our friend palmitic acid. I took about 50 grams of coconut oil and placed it into a beaker. Next, I melted the oil down. Once it was liquid, I dropped in a stir bar and started stirring. I then poured in a sodium hydroxide solution into the oil. I continue heating the mix and allow stirring. Those of you with some background in chemistry know what we are doing here. We are making soap. I will cover more of that chemistry when we make exploding soap later on. Soon the mix starts to thicken and we have some curds that have formed. I increased heating and stirring, and soon after, the soap thickens, reaching trace. Currently we have a bunch of carbon chains with sodium carboxylate groups on it, which is fine for soap, for your hands, but it won't work for us for use as a napalm. We need to bond all these carbons together to get a gasoline gelling effect that we want. To do this, I added an essential compound for napalm, aluminum sulfate. Adding this will kick off the sodium, forming sodium sulfate and an aluminum soap. Sodium can only bond to one carboxylate group, but aluminum can bind to three. This creates a mess of long carbon chains all binded together. I then took this off heat and now we have a lovely mass of soap. I plopped the soap into molds and grabbed the hot soap and placed it into the fridge to cool it off faster. A filtering step could be used to remove any of the water-soluble impurities, such as the sodium sulfate that is formed, but this is unnecessary for our napalm. Once the soap cooled, I used a grater to make it into finer particles to make it easier to dry. For drying, the soap is placed into a desiccator and left for 24 hours. Throughout drying, I mixed up the soap to make sure that it dried evenly. After the day has passed, the soap is still a bit wet. So I took the dryish soap and placed it into a drying oven for a few hours to drive off any leftover water. Here is our dry aluminum soap powder. This is technically our napalm, but most people refer to napalm as a generic term for thickened flammable liquid, not the soap that which it is. The soap has melted together a bit and the container that was closest to the heater has turned a light brown, but it should still work. Taking the soap and placing it into a beaker, we can test it out. 
I put a stir bar into the soap mix and started adding gasoline. It takes a little bit of stirring, but the soap slowly soaks up the gasoline, gelling it. Gasoline is added till a reasonable thickness is reached and no more lumps are present. Adding an excess of gasoline is not a problem. The thickened gasoline will sink to the bottom and any liquid will float on top, which can be removed later. The beaker test gelled up quite nicely, so I took the rest of the soap and turned it into gelled gasoline. Now onto the burn test. The reason why napalm is so useful is it because the gasoline is normally a liquid and will disperse and just run off objects. But napalm will stick to those objects that it comes into contact with and continue burning, causing significant damage. Here's three grams of gasoline. Let's dump it onto a tray and do a burn test. As expected, it all runs down the metal and engulfs the area in flames, but most of the gasoline is just sitting at the bottom, not where we poured it. Let's compare that to the same weight of napalm. The gooey gel sticks to the metal, but also runs down the tray. Lighting it, we see it flame up and spread the flames as it burns. This is quite scary stuff. The napalm we made here is not as good as the military stuff, but it gets the job done. The main difference is it's less goopy than the good stuff. Another variant is gasoline mixed with styrofoam, but this is nowhere near real napalm. It's much too thick. It makes it very hard to shoot out of flamethrowers. So to answer the question, can you make napalm from orange juice? The answer is yes, but you also learned that you can make napalm from coconut oil. You can also get the same effect by shaving down ivory soap and mixing it with gasoline. Tyler is very much so right when he says, One can make all kinds of explosives using simple household items. Really? If one was so inclined. After getting off the plane, the narrator returns home to find his apartment in ruins. He says that the cause of the explosion is natural gas that slowly filled the apartment till a spark set it off. First, what is natural gas? It's a mix of various gases, mainly methane. This gas is the simplest of hydrocarbons, consisting of one carbon and four hydrogens. We use natural gas because of its high energy content. Burning a hydrocarbon such as methane releases loads of heat at low cost. The same reason why it's useful is also why it's dangerous. Let's test it out. I took a few balloons and I filled them with natural gas and different ratios of oxygen. First up, pure natural gas. I lit a small flame next to the balloon to help ignite the gas. Touching the candle flame to the balloon, we get a giant fireball as expected. Next, natural gas mixed with a low concentration of oxygen. Touching it, we get a flame and we get much more of a pop and faster combustion than the unmixed natural gas, but not as fast as it could be. Now the natural gas is mixed with a perfect stoichiometric ratio of oxygen. Touching this balloon, we get a detonation. In each test, the chemical reaction that occurs is combustion. This is a reaction that most people are familiar with, where methane reacts with oxygen to produce carbon dioxide and water, along with a whole heap of energy. Combustion takes place all the time. The burning of a candle is combustion, but why doesn't this explode as the natural gas does? And why do natural gas stoves burn without exploding? Earlier, I mentioned the term stoichiometric ratio. This is the ratio between chemicals in a reaction. Having a perfect blend of natural gas and oxygen allows for a rapid reaction to take place. When chemicals react rapidly, you can have an explosion. In the case of the candle and stove, the reaction happens slowly and no boom occurs. The slowness is caused by the reactants having to mix. In the stove case, the natural gas has to slowly react with the oxygen in the air. 
This mix isn't instantaneous, and it has to diffuse for it to burn. With the candle, the heat has to vaporize the paraffin wax so that it can mix with oxygen and burn. Unlike the premixed balloons, which have the natural gas and oxygen already mixed together. So yes, natural gas explosions like the movie occur due to small leaks when the correct ratio of gas to air is exposed to ignition source. Now you don't always need a perfect ratio, as even if there's no detonation, the reaction produces gases that can apply force. If you do smell natural gas in your home, call the proper authorities. An interesting thing about natural gas is it does not actually smell. A chemical called myrcaptan is added to the gas to make it easily detectable by us humans. The central premise of chemistry of Fight Club is that with enough soap, you can blow up anything. But can you make explosives from soap? The answer is yes, but it's quite annoying. Yeah, with enough soap, one can blow up just about anything. I cannot legally get human fat, so I will start with beef tallow. The tallow is a natural fat produced by cows. This fat can undergo a reaction known as saponification to form soap. First, I melted down the tallow using a water bath. While melting, let's prepare our sodium hydroxide solution. The fat weighed around 396 grams, so for a complete reaction, I need 55.4 grams of sodium hydroxide mixed into 124 milliliters of water. Adding the sodium hydroxide to water produces heat, which helps it dissolve faster. Sodium hydroxide is very caustic and will burn you if it comes into contact with your skin, as shown in the movie. This is a chemical burn. Ah! Ah! You'll hurt more than you've ever been burned, and you have Next, the molten fat is poured into a large beaker, and stirring is started. Following this, the sodium hydroxide solution is added to the fat, and stirring is increased. The fat contains glyceryl esters, which have a carboxylate group, we call these fatty acids. Heating the fat with a solution of sodium hydroxide, a strong base in water, the esters are hydrolyzed into glycerol and salts of the fatty acids, aka soap. This reaction is the previously mentioned saponification reaction. The same reaction that's happening here is what we did earlier to make our napalm soap. For simplicity, let's assume our fat is glyceryl tricerate. This reaction with sodium hydroxide forms sodium serate, aka soap, and a byproduct known as glycerol, sometimes also called glycerin. Once the soap is stiffened, it reaches a point known as trace. We leave it on heat for about an hour and allow the reaction to finish. The soap reaction is now complete. We actually don't care about the soap. We just want the byproduct that was produced from the reaction, the glycerin. Currently, the glycerin is trapped in the soap. To get this out, we will use sodium chloride, common table salt. I add 250 grams of plain table salt to the soap. Mixing it in creates a soap salt mix. I used a spatula to stir in the salt and used heating with the help of a bit of water to soften up the soap. By adding sodium chloride to the soap, we use a technique called salting out. The sodium chloride displaces the glycerin from the soap and pushes it into the water. After stirring for a bit, I let the soap mix cool down to room temperature. This causes two portions to form glycerin with salt water, and the soap mixed with salt. The glycerin-salt water mix is then poured through a filter and the soap is left to allow more liquid to collect at the bottom. I collected all this liquid with the aid of a spatula to help push out any trapped liquid that might be stuck in the soap. Once all the liquid was collected, the soap was removed and placed into a mold to cure. The soap can be used as a regular soap now. It just needs a few days for any leftover sodium hydroxide to react with the carbon dioxide in the air, curing the soap, making it safe to use. You don't want to be rubbing pure sodium hydroxide onto your skin. There still is a bunch of water left over, so to get rid of this excess water, I will use a water bath and slowly evaporate the excess water off, concentrating the glycerin and any leftover salt. After a few hours, all the water is almost gone. A lot of salt has also fallen out of solution. I need to separate the salt from the glycerin. I could filter, but most of the glycerin is trapped within the salt. So like most things in life, 
alcohol is the solution. Using isopropyl alcohol, we can dissolve out the glycerin and leave most of the salt behind. The salt and solutions are then filtered and washed a few times with isopropyl alcohol to remove as much glycerin from the salt as possible. Next, the isopropyl alcohol is left to evaporate off. Some salt that made its way over falls out of solution, and again, I filter it. The salt here is much too fine to filter normally, so I'll use a fretted glass filter with some sea light to trap the ultra-fine salt particles. The solution is then left to evaporate again, and after all has evaporated, our thick glycerin is left behind. I transferred this out to a teared vial, and we measure our horrible yield of 2.8 grams. This is a 6.57% of the expected 42 grams. I suspect most of the glycerin is still trapped in the soap, but I have enough to continue. Now with the glycerin in hand, the next step is to add nitrate groups to form nitroglycerin, an explosive. Needless to say, don't try this at home. And for those reasons, I won't be giving out perfect details on the production methods, even though anyone with a high school chemistry knowledge could figure it out. I began by mixing nitric acid with a drying acid, in a 50-50 by volume ratio. A thermal reaction occurs here and needs to be added slowly. The acid mix here is sometimes referred to as mixed acids. The mix is very important as it forms nitronium ions which will be used in the reaction. The reaction produces another ion from the deprotonated sulfuric acid. You will see in later steps that this ion is regenerated to form the sulfuric acid. Now with the nitronium ions, we can begin the reaction. Notice how all the equipment is made from plastic. This is very important, as if there was a rapid, unplanned disassembly of glassware, plastic is a bit stronger and less prone to sending glass shrapnel everywhere. To the acids, the glycerin is slowly added, to avoid a thermal runaway. We want the acid mix warm, but not too hot, around 40 degrees Celsius. Once the reaction is complete, the mix is poured into an ice-cold bath of water to separate out the nitroglycerin. Due to its density, the nitroglycerin falls to the bottom. I then pipe pipe it out to another bottle of ice cold water for storage before use. Nitroglycerin is quite unstable and should be used quickly after production. There's a reason why we don't use it anymore. A few small drops are placed onto an anvil. And due to its sensitivity, it can be set off with a blow of a hammer. The chemistry depicted in Fight Club is quite accurate. Yes, natural gas causes explosions. And the most important one, soap can be used in the manufacture of high explosives. I can't imagine how much fat one would need to do what was depicted in the movie. If this video does well, I may explore the science of other popular movies and TV shows. If there's a movie or show in specific that you want to see, post that in the comment section below. I might even cover Breaking Bad albeit without the production of illicit drugs. Thanks for watching. We have a bunch of napalm left over, so let's burn that off.